So we are in week two of our new midweek series called, well, I screwed up last week. I called it No Doubt, which is the band name. It's actually Doubt It, which is actually probably a better indicator of where most of us come from when we are approaching the Bible. Is There's a lot of things in here that we look at and we go, is that quite right? That doesn't seem like it should, like that's the normal thing. And and for a lot of the things in the Bible, there's a lot of truth to feeling that way, that we read these incredible stories of what God did, and we have this sense of skepticism, of doubting it. And I think that's completely okay. And, and last week I shared the story of a guy named Gideon. And Gideon was in a place where... Um, his nation, Israel, was being overrun by uh, an evil empire called the Midianites. And the Midianites were coming to kill them all and was going to take over Israel. And Gideon was called by God to go and lead a very, very small army, actually, to go fight the Midianites. Now, leading up to the story of this, though, Gideon was... was very skeptical of God's calling on his life. And to the point that he actually doubted God at least five times. The two big ones we talked about last week was when God had called him and he said, hey, God, if you're really God, I'm going to put this fleece outside and I want it to be wet and the ground dry. And God did it. And still Gideon was like, ah, I'm still not quite sure. So then he said, I'm going to put the fleece outside. And I want the, the ground to be wet and the fleece dry or whatever it was, the backwards part of it. And, and God did all that. And he met every single one of Gideon's questions. And so today, as we continue this series of Doubt It, I want you to think about those moments in your life where somebody has told you something that maybe you're like, eh, I don't quite believe you. You know, last week I, I used the, uh, the example I give at the beginning of my school year in science is that, you know, if, if Taylor Swift's marketing director called you and said, hey, I need your address and we're going to pull up and pick you up and take you and your friends out to eat lunch with Taylor Swift, you would be a little skeptical of that. Like you would, eh, are you really Taylor Swift's marketing person? I mean, I hope you would anyways. If you, and if you've never experienced something like that, like you're, you're waiting for more evidence, just wait till you're a parent. Because when you have kids, you're going to be met with this all the time. You know, Jackson and Alexia will run up to us, and they both have a story of what happened, why something was broke, why someone was hurt, why someone wasn't doing what the other person wanted to do. And there's lack of evidence. And so we're sitting there and we're trying to sort it out. And oftentimes, especially with Jackson and Lexi, it's just kind of like, uh, is, is anybody dying? No. OK, go play. But we want the evidence to be able to make decisions because that's how life works. If you've ever watched a crime show, you've seen it where uh, there's this phrase that you have the difference between knowing something and proving something. You know, the detective will come and be like, I know he's guilty. And the, the person in charge, like the district attorney, will be like, yeah, but knowing it and proving it are two separate things. And that's completely true. But sometimes we hold out in areas that we don't need to hold out in. Okay. And so today we're going to look at in the New Testament. So Gideon was in the Old Testament thousands of years ago. Fast forward a few hundred thousand years. And we get to the times of Jesus. I'm going to read a passage from John chapter 20. And in John 20, okay, Jesus lived among the apostles for about three and a half years, his earthly ministry before he died on the cross. And almost every step of the way, even if they, they may have been distanced because Jesus hung back and sent them forward or Jesus separated himself from the group to pray, most of those three and a half years, this group of 12 were with Jesus all the time. Okay, they traveled around with him. There were times where he sent them out to go do things. But for most of those three and a half years, they were very, very close. Okay, and so the apostles were very convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, that, uh, that he was coming to deliver his people. And then we get to uh, the, the celebration of the last Passover with Jesus, and he, he tells them that he's going to die. And, and then he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prays, and the, the crowd comes to arrest him. And the disciples are in shock. In fact, most of them ran away. And so Thomas is who we're going to talk about here for a second. All the apostles, again, I've talked about how I, I really like the apostles because they give such a, a wide variety of people that 
you can connect with any one of them, all right? There are times I'm like Peter. I'm, I'm the outspoken one. I'm the one throwing my hand up to answer questions. And then there's times I'm more like Thomas, okay? Thomas is the, is the one that we call him Doubting Thomas. And, and the story I'm about to read is really the highlight of his doubt. But there were a couple times in the scripture where Thomas proved to be a little skeptical. All right. And so in John chapter 20, Jesus has died on the cross. He's buried. He's rose again. And on the first day that he has risen, um, well, let's start here with John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, this is talking about when he arose. When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And then verse 24 says this, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Now, we don't know what he was doing. We just know he wasn't there. You know, there's any number of reasons, you know, he could have been out and getting food for the, the group or whatever. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. So Jesus appears, the disciples are together, but Thomas is not there. Now, again, Thomas has been with them almost the entire time for the last three and a half years. And Thomas isn't there. Listen to what he said. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, first of all, I don't know why Thomas goes to the extent to say that, you know, I want to stick my hand where the spear was in his side. That seems a little over the top. I think I would have been satisfied with just seeing Jesus, but... Thomas is taking this to an extreme. He's so heartbroken over what has happened that he, he, his natural skepticism is then taken to another level because of the heartache that he feels for the death of his Savior. And so Jesus has appeared to them. Thomas isn't there. And they're all saying, we saw him, we saw him. And Thomas is like, mm-hmm, sure you did. Whatever, guys. Listen, until I see him and I feel the scars and I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later. Okay, so a week, seven days. Can you imagine that week? I don't know. Just in my mind, I, I feel like, are you sure you're not going to believe Thomas? Come on, Thomas. We all saw him. There's 11 of us. Not all of us are lying to you. Mary and Martha, we saw They all saw him. We all saw him. Why will you not believe this? And Thomas is holding out. A week later, Jesus' disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, again, so the apostles are still kind of living in a little bit of fear because Jesus was crucified by the Romans and the Jewish leaders, and, and so they're kind of living in fear. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Okay, starts out the same. Then he said to Thomas, Now listen, I want to pause here because I want you to focus on what Jesus says here. If, if I was in Thomas's position... I'm not sure how I would have felt in this moment. So Jesus is coming. He's approaching Thomas. Is, is Jesus going to be mad that I doubted that he appeared to the apostles? Is he going to be frustrated that I question him? Is he going to shame me for my lack of faith? Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did not shame Thomas for wanting evidence. All right? And I think growing up for me, questioning God was kind of this place where it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't really encouraged. You know, we, we want to say we live by faith. And the reality is God does not desire for us to live these lives of blind faith without any questions. He knows that's not reasonable for us. We are people who celebrate finding evidence and truth. And so when we turn that to our, our study of the scriptures, our study of God in general, I genuinely believe that God desires for us to search 
for Him with our whole hearts and our minds. Because when we search for, our, for God with our minds, when we study truth, we come to some conclusions, okay? Jesus didn't shame Thomas for wanting evidence, and he doesn't shame us either. In fact, Jesus does the same thing for us that he did for Thomas. He provides us the evidence we need to be able to go forward and believe. Now, the, the rest of history for Thomas, does, we, we don't have a lot of information, but we know that he went with the apostles to Jerusalem during the day of Pentecost. We know that from there he went out and he spread the gospel. So he didn't doubt anymore. He, he, went, he had a, an evidence that drove his faith, okay? An evidence that drove his faith. And that's, frankly, that's who I am. Okay, I, everybody's wired differently, right? We all have different ways, different personalities. I'm, I'm a pretty skeptical guy and I, I want evidence. I want to know. And so when I was in high school and I started answering or searching out these questions for myself, like about creation and about the history of the world, there were some things that, that were opened up to me. And the evidence as I saw confirmed for me the things that I, I knew in my heart but didn't know in my head that and and God gave me the evidence I needed to be able to believe the, in those gaps okay so here's the thing we're going to go forward and we're going to study we're going to know God's truth because listen all truth is God's truth recently I was watching um, a series of lectures, yeah, I'm a nerd, by a guy named Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson is one of the greatest minds of our generation, okay? He's like the Albert Einstein of our generation in terms of uh, what he does in, in science, but he's also this great communicator, and I love listening to him talk, but he's, I don't know if he, I would classify him as atheist or agnostic, as somebody that does not have a belief in God. And before I listened to him talk, I kind of had this line of belief, like on this side we're Christians and, and we believe in the Bible and there's a, a, a source of faith for us. On this side we're atheists and, and, and that these people who, um, their pursuit of science has blinded them to how God has organized things to put in place. And I've kind of come to the conclusion that it's more curved because there were things that Neil deGrasse Tyson said that are very, very similar to things that I have said about being a Christ follower. He talks about a cosmic perspective and, and the universe is so big and so expanse that we are made from stardust. Okay, let's go back to Genesis in chapter one when God said he made us from dust. Um, God's been saying this for 6,000 years and Neil deGrasse Tyson says it a few weeks ago and everybody's like, oh my gosh, it's so amazing. The reality is all truth is God's truth. And when we look at it from that perspective, we're able to see more clearly in those evidences how God has worked all these things to be, okay? History has been trying for years, his historical uh, you know, researchers and archeologists, and when they dig things up, they've never found something that goes, oh, this disproves completely the Bible. What they have found more often than not is that things that they had read in the Bible and they thought, ah, we haven't sound, found any historical evidences of those people. Uh, that people group does not exist in our histories. And then they'll go and they'll do some research and they actually find it. And they're like, oh, well, the Bible got us again. And it's amazing how many times that happens, even in the area of psychology. I find it amazing when psychologists come out and they say, you know, if, if we will institute this type of practice in our lives, we'll lead much healthier and more satisfied lives. And it's in the book of Proverbs. Like something they'll have said is founded by research. They'll come out and say this and, and all these scientists are like, oh my goodness, that's so mind boggling. And I'm sitting here going, you just got that out of Proverbs chapter three. It's amazing. When we start looking at all truth being God's truth, the evidence is clear that God is who he says he is, but he encourages us. He, he's not mad at us when we have doubt or when we have questions. All right, guys. So remember one, you're not alone in your questions. And two, God is bigger than our questions and he will provide us the answers we need to grow in our faith. To give you an example of that, you know, scientists aren't too far from living in a faith, if you will. Tomorrow morning, roughly around 
6.30 a.m. I don't know, I haven't looked at the times. Across the eastern horizon, the sun is going to appear to rise. We call it rising as the Earth's rotation uh, sh displays the sun in the, in the galaxy, in the solar system, and, and we get to see it. I, I, I'm guessing, based on 6,000 years of experience, that tomorrow morning, the sun is going to do the exact same thing. And that's going to do it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. So based on this history of evidence, I am confident that the sun is going to do this again. That is my relationship with God. Based on the evidence of the Bible and the things that have happened in my life, I know that he's never going to leave me or forsake me. I know that whatever difficulty I'm walking through, God is walking through it with me. So when I look at that and I see that history of what God has done, I can have faith in what he's going to do.